Hello everyone, Pastor Brian Clark here from Friendship Baptist Church of Level Cross, North Carolina, inviting you to another edition from Across the Pastor's Desk. I'd like to take just a few minutes and ask a simple question, and I've asked many people around the ministry for many years, why is Easter so important? Or maybe we could word it like this. Why is Easter so important to you? Or we could ask another question. Is Easter an important holiday to observe for you? Now, we know around the world that many, many will be celebrating Easter's in many societies and fashions in all different kinds of ways. And all kinds of families have their own traditions and, and their favorite uh chocolate candies and eggs, all of these kinds of things. But in order to be able to answer the question of why Easter is so important or may Easter is not important to you, is first of all, we would have to identify Easter. Now, we know as most holidays, especially in our nation, that these holidays are commercialized taken way out of context and billions of dollars are spent on these holidays. If you're going to wear green, if you're going to buy presents, if you're going to buy candy such as Easter. And many times we see our children, my children included when they were small, they would go out and hunt Easter eggs and, and they would talk about the Easter bunny and uh, we would have to go out and go shopping and buy candy to fill their Easter baskets. And it's a great time as a child uh, to be able to go out and hunt Easter eggs. It is just a, a great time. And I'm not against children's activities. But when I grew up, I began to understand there's a lot more to Easter than the mystery Easter bunny uh, and eggs and candy and commercialism and, and these kinds of things that we see often in our society. Well, what is Easter? What is the true meaning of Easter? Well, the true meaning of Easter is not eggs and candy and rabbits and hunting eggs and these things, although they're fun as a, as a, as a child to be able to do these activities. They're great. They're a lot of fun. But the true meaning of Easter is the resurrection of of Jesus. Now, when I talk about his resurrection, I'm not talking about reviving. I'm not talking about uh, some Hindu practice to where you come back in a reincarnation. I'm talking about resurrection. Now, in order for someone to be resurrected, you must first have to die. You have to be dead. Dead as a door now. You have to be dead. So when we talk about Easter and the importance of Easter, when you get down to the nuts and bolts of Easter, it really has nothing to do with what is commercialized in a lot of areas in our nation today. But in a biblical format, Easter, Easter is so important because without the resurrection of Christ, there is no Easter. Without the resurrection of Christ, there is no Easter. Now, we know tomorrow is Good Friday. And what is so good about Good Friday? Well, Christ goes to the cross. And then we know that Christ uh, came up out of the grave Sunday morning very early as the women came down to the tomb. Jesus was resurrected. Now, who resurrected him? God did, his Father, and also the Spirit, and he resurrected himself. But what is so important about Easter? Without Jesus' death, without his resurrection, there is no such thing called Christianity. There is no sense in preaching or teaching the Bible because it would simply be worthless. It would be a waste of time because the Bible would not be true. 
because there is prophecy in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that promises us that the Messiah, that is Jesus, would come. And he did. He was born of a virgin and he came and he grew up and roughly 33 years old. They crucified him, put him on the cross. And on the third day, he rose again. Without this resurrection, I'm going to say it one more time. Your faith is worthless. Christianity is not true. And the gospel would be untrue. But thanks be to God that Jesus truly did resurrect on that third day. If you've got your Bibles, I'm going to be reading out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses three and four, and we're going to take just a brief few minutes to look at the importance of this Easter holiday. I'm going to begin reading here. As I bend down here, I will be right back as I read these scriptures. I'm going to read these scriptures slowly and let them let them come into your heart and mind, because this has to do all about with Easter. Once again, what is Easter? Jesus rising from the dead, just as he said he would, just as he promised. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, he says, Moreover, brethren, now who is this? This is Paul speaking. He's talking to the church at Corinth. He says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received. So here he's talking to these believers. They have received the gospel wherein you stand. This is how you stand today. You're a believer by which you are also saved. Well, you can't be saved outside of the gospel message. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now, if you come to the Lord and you are not really, really desiring to be saved because God has not put this in your heart and you truly do not believe the gospel well, then your believing is not believing. It is a worthless believing. And many times it really scares me when someone comes to the altar and they come down to be saved and there's all a lot of times of emotion and that's okay. But I just pray for that individual that they truly did believe. But back in first Corinthians chapter 15, for I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Paul received the gospel. <clears throat> Excuse me. How that Christ died for our sins. Now here he begins describing the gospel. How Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures. So Paul is standing on the authority of God's word. He is saying that Jesus died for our sins. Excuse me. <coughs> he died for our sins. According to the scriptures. And he was buried. That's according to the scriptures. And he rose again on the third day. And it says again, according to the scriptures. So now let me tell you the importance of this passage. It has a lot of meat here. But if Jesus never rose again, or you can say if he never died and rose again on the third day, your Bible is useless because the scriptures have been broken. And we know that is not true. We know that Jesus died on, on that cross to forgive us of our sin, our sinful nature, and we know that he rose again on the third day. But let's look at some more elements here of our Easter. Without Jesus' physical death on the cross, and that is referred to as his crucifixion, uh, which he died to forgive us of our sins. Without his death, there would not be a need or there would not be a resurrection. Many try to explain away his death in many different uh, folklores or philosophies or religions. Listen, Jesus died on that cross. That is according to the scriptures. We just read that. That's what Paul testified. 
Without the resurrection of Christ, there is no gospel. Without the resurrection of Christ, there is no gospel. There's no gospel message. There would be no true gospel message. Without the resurrection, we would be in trouble, mankind, because without the resurrection of Christ, which means he did not die on the cross, that means we can't be forgiven of our sinful nature. Well, there's a lot to think about here on Easter holiday. Jesus's resurrection from the dead separates him from any other religious leader, any other leader who has ever been seen that has lived or will ever live this Jesus prophesied that he would die and on the third day he would rise again. All other religions, all other figures, they're still in the grave. But I can tell you this much, according to the scriptures, Jesus' tomb on that Sunday morning was empty. There was nothing in it but his linens, the Bible says. It means his clothing, his burial clothing. Jesus accomplished what no other man no other religion, no other figure could ever accomplish, and that is he conquered death. And not only did he conquer death for himself, like he said he would, but he also conquered death for you and for me. Praise God. Hallelujah. Jesus rising from the dead proves that his claim of who he said he was is true. Well, what claim did he have? Well, he claimed to be God. He was God in the flesh. And he came upon this earth and walked upon this earth in the flesh as a man, yet he said, I and the Father are one which means he was God himself. Only God, only God, the true and living God, has the power to raise physically from the dead. And he did so. Just as he claimed who he was, he proved by his resurrection, just as he promised, that he would rise on that third day. Well, as we continue on with a few more notes here, Jesus' resurrection fulfilled Old and New Testament prophecy. In Psalm chapter 16, in Isaiah chapter 53, you can certainly read in the Old Testament uh, there about some prophecies of the coming of the Messiah and that the Messiah would die and that he would raise again. But you know, when we look back to this Roman crucifixion. Now, when you look back to the Roman crucifixion, a lot of people says, well, you know what? That was something very special that they did for very few people. I've heard that preached and taught. And actually, that's the furthest thing from the truth. Thousands and thousands through history faced crucifixion on an old Roman cross. And as Jesus was condemned and was sentenced to death and he died upon that cross, to many, it was just another criminal being put on the cross that would be crucified. But here's the difference. Jesus was never a criminal. Jesus never knew sin. Jesus did not sin. So as you read in the Old Testament, he was hung among the transgressors, 
This amazing scripture in Isaiah chapter 53, he would be numbered with the transgressors, which means he was treated as a common criminal and he was put upon that Roman cross. Many bodies of those crosses that was hung, the bodies were buried and they were buried and their bodies are still there. But Jesus' body is not there. And it really humors me to see these documentaries on TV or hear about on the radio to where someone spends millions of dollars and they're going to go out and find Jesus and they're going to find his body and they're going to find all of these artifacts about Jesus. Folks, Jesus ain't here. <laughs> he has risen and went to the Father. After he had died on that cross and he resurrected on that, 30 day, on that third day, within a matter of time, he said, I must ascend back to my father. And another thing about this resurrection. Do you know that the scripture tells us that over 500 people saw Jesus after his resurrection? And of course, we know the disciples and others did. But over 500 people saw Jesus after he had died on the cross. How could they have seen him? Because he resurrected again. Jesus is alive. Listen, if you have a dead Savior in the ground somewhere, then you have no chance of salvation because a dead Savior can't save. But thanks be to God, Jesus did rise from the grave, and he is alive forevermore, and he has the power to forgive sins, and yes, we can be saved. As we continue on with a few elements, in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, it says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that came unto God by him, seeing that he lives ever or ever liveth. He ever liveth. This is talking about after his resurrection. He lives to make intercession for them. Who? Mankind. What does intercession mean? Between you and God, when you are still in your sins and you have never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, there is no way that one day that you're going to stand before God justified, which means stand before God and say, God, here I am. I did the best I could in this life. There's no way that you can stand before him and not be found guilty. But thanks be to Christ that died upon the cross. When you and I, all these, all of us who believe, when we stand before God, we stand before him justified. What does that mean? that Jesus truly does have the power to forgive sins. And one day when we stand before the Father, Jesus is going to say, this one belongs to me. He was saved by the blood. He was justified. She was justified, which means that you will stand before God blameless only because of the power of the blood, not because of anything that you ever did or can do or will do. For you cannot be saved by works, for by grace are you saved. So what is this? Jesus is our intercessor. He is our intercession for them. Jesus died on the cross. Think of it this way. Between God and man, Jesus is the bridge. God calls you to be saved, yet you must believe in Christ. You must believe that he died. You must believe in this resurrection. You must believe in who he is. You must believe that he has the power to forgive sins. Jesus 
is the bridge. He is that narrow road that can take you to heaven. And I promise you, you will never get there by church membership, by baptism, or anything that you ever possibly think that you could do that would merit you favor with God, for it is only through Christ. Let me, let me go back before we finish here, just get a couple more minutes. Let me ask this question again. How important is Easter? Let me break it down a step further. How important is Easter to you? Well, let's look at a few more elements. Jesus' resurrection gives us hope, gives us great hope. You say, well, how could his resurrection, meaning he rose from the dead, give us hope? Because Jesus said, if you believe in him, he gave us this promise that as he resurrected, so will you. You see, that's why believers doesn't fear death. Oh, I don't know of a believer that just wants to voluntarily die. I, I, I really haven't seen that. But I have seen believers before they died. And they comforted me on their deathbed. How could they do that? Because they said, don't worry about me. I'm going home. How could they say this? How could they think this? Because they had that hope, the same hope that Jesus promised for us, that he would resurrect us someday, and we would go to heaven. So as we continue on in some elements here, in 1 Corinthians, I'm still in chapter 15. I'm going to read verses 20 and 23 through 23. But now here is Paul again. He's at, talking to Corinth. He says, but now is Christ risen from the dead. So that's a solid fact. And he became the first fruits. That means he was the first one of them that slept. The word slept here means to die. He was the first one. He was our example to die. For since by man came death, what is it talking about? All the way back in the Garden of Eden, man sinned, and now we have this sin nature. Let me read that again. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Now, wait a minute. What is he saying here? Well, you don't have to die in your sins. You can be resurrected. He says, for as in Adam, all die. We physically all die, but that's not exactly what Paul is saying here. We die here in this passage, which means we will be separated from God. Separated from God. So let me read that again. For as in Adam, all die. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So if we are never truly saved, born again, believing in Christ, all of those describe believing the gospel message, then you are still in your sins because you're still the natural man and you have never been spiritually born. Well, as we continue on here, believers who have physically died will have eternal life. They will not just perish. They don't just disappear. They don't stay in the grave forever. Now, let me give you a fact about that, because we always hear believers, 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 and they're rising. They're going to heaven because they believe, and they will live eternally. Well, that is true. But here is also another true fact. The lost will live forever, too. You see, believers will live forever as they come into the presence of God, and they will dwell with him forever and ever. And you remember in Revelation where John said, no one, no crying, no pain, all these things or former things are passed away. No more tears, no more death, no more of all of these former things. Well, that's because the believer had come into the presence of God. Now, what about the unbeliever? Well, they live forever too but it won't be in heaven. The Bible claims that they will go to hell. And that's a realization. And that's a fact. 
No matter what tells who tells you in the world, that's not hate speech. <laughs> it is biblical precept. It is biblical um, the word of God. It, it is true. It's biblical. Just as the believer has eternal life, so does the unbeliever. But I promise you, you don't want the unbeliever's eternal life. But as we finish up here, I want to talk about something for a minute. When I just read about believers will physically die someday, but when we physically die, we will be raised again and have eternal life. For Christ says he will promise he will come back and he will raise us out of the grave and we will go to meet with him and be forever in heaven. I want to read just a couple of scriptures and let it soak in as we've just got a couple minutes left. We read John 3.16 often, but let me read a couple of verses after 3.16 with the verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Pe people doesn't perish. But those that believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son in the world to, de to condemn the world. God uh, is not did not create you just to condemn you and send you to hell. God created you because he loved you and he provided Jesus to save you so you can be with him eternally. Let me get back to the verse. For God sent not his son to in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That was the purpose of Jesus coming to the earth. Mm. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. So you see, you have all of mankind. Now I'm talking about adults that, that comes to the age of accountability and knows what salvation means and being born again. I'm not talking about young children. I'm talking about those that are old enough of accountability. There is those that's living a condemned life and those that's living a victorious life. Hmm. Let me read the last part of this verse. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Another quick verse, Romans 8 and 11. But if the spirit of him, now I love this verse, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, that's the Holy Spirit, raised up Jesus from the dead, dwell in you. That means the moment you are saved, the Holy Spirit indwells in the believer. So this spirit that indwells into the believer, listen and let me read this one more time. Now remember when you are saved, this Holy Spirit comes into you automatically, instantaneously, at the moment you trust Christ. Knowing that, let me read this verse again. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. What does quicken mean? That means he is going to bring alive your mortal bodies, your physical bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. You see, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that comes into the Christian the moment he believes. And that same spirit, when Jesus returns, will bring us forth out of that grave where we will be uh, with God forever in glory. One more verse. John 10, ch uh, chapter 10, verse 27 and 28. Now, this is Jesus speaking. He says, my sheep hear my voice. Now, who are that? The believers. My sheep hear my voice. And he says, I know them. Salvation is personal. And they follow me. And I give them eternal life. It's a gift. You don't earn it. You'll never be good enough to go to heaven. You'll never be the best to go to heaven. You'll never live life to its fullest to the greatest human need and go to glory. It can't happen. Let's read that again. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give. Who is that? Jesus. 
I give them eternal life. Jesus gives you eternal life the moment you trust in him. What a gift. And here's that word perish again. He says, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Neither can anyone, anything, remove eternal life from them. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this short devotional. Um, how important is Easter to you? Well, there's a lot of facts that we've covered in a short few minutes. Boy, everything hinges off Jesus resurrecting from the dead. Everything in our life hinges off the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Easter is very vital. It's a very, very important holiday. And I hope this Easter Sunday that you can celebrate it. And I know if you have children or grandchildren, I know you have fun with all those little children activities as I do too. But as an adult, as one that comes to the knowledge, we have to accept the fact that Easter is real and Christ truly did rise from the grave. And amen and amen. Well, here at Friendship Baptist Church of Level Cross, North Carolina, it has been posted on our Facebook page that we are wanting to have a drive-in service on Easter Sunday. Well, according to the weather, it is supposed to rain all day Sunday, which is going to make it impossible to have a drive-in service. However, I'm not ready to cancel out Sunday service just yet. It will be a Friday evening or a Saturday morning if we see that the rain is just going to be here and we can't have our drive-in service, then I will post on Facebook. Uh, those that attend the church here, I will put it and update it by phone tree. So I will sure, surely give you the update about our Easter um, Sunday service. Hope you've enjoyed the service today. So when Easter comes on Easter Sunday, Really take thought for your life. Really see the vital importance of Easter. And I hope to see you next on another edition from across the pastor's desk. May God bless.